Let me get my notes situated here. All right. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's turn to Our Lady and ask her to intercede as together we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. John the Evangelist, pray for in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 6, and let's go to verse 9, where I think we touched upon it, but remember I was, saying, I was saying we were just kind of burned out, and we're like, let's just stop here, because it was a good stopping point. We'll finish. There's two more seals, and then there's a pause, and then uh, we don't have the seventh seal opened until there's two visions that John has of heaven. And so it's kind of like a Sort of like, you know, pause, we'll get back to it next week, like you're watching, uh, you know, sort of a series. And um, so let's go to verse 9. And it says, When he broke open the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slaughtered because of the witness they bore to the word of God. They cried out in a loud voice, How long will it be holy and true master? Before you sit in judgment and avenge our blood on the inhabitants of the earth, each of them was given a white robe. As they were told to be patient a little longer until the number was filled of their fellow servants and brothers who were going to be killed as they had been. Okay, so let's, uh, let's just stop there. All right, now. This fifth seal, we see the vision of those who had died for their faith. Now, notice uh, one of the words we have here is who had been slaughtered because of the witness. Now, in Greek, uh, that's where we get the word. It, the Greek word is very close to our word for martyr. These are those who are, you know, shed their blood uh, for Christ. And uh, in a, a cross-reference, remember a lot of times the Old Testament sheds light to what's happening in the New Testament if you want to you write this down, you can look it up later. I'll just read it to you. Leviticus chapter 4, verse 7 says, The rest of the blood of the bull will be poured out at the base of the altar. Okay, now, first off, we have to understand what's the significance of blood in the altar in the Old Testament, and then tie it into what we believe as Catholics in the New Testament, right? So, uh, when animals were, remember we talked about last time, the two sacrifices and the, the daily, what was the word for the daily sacrifice? The tamid sacrifice. Remember this? Is that ringing a bell? It's only been a week, right? So the tamid, T-A-M-I-D, sacrifice in the morning and then in the evening, there were, there were lambs sacrificed, right? Do you remember what time the second lamb was sacrificed? Three. Three, right? And we see that our Lord would be, and, it would, and, the, and they would, remember, they would tie, they basically tie the lamb up so people could watch in the little lamb that's about to be sacrificed, and it would be on, on, on display for how long? Three hours. Okay. Coincidence or providence, right? And then Jesus Christ would be, you know, suspended from wood and then sacrificed, and his blood would be shed for us. Um, now, in, the, in, the, in, this, in these ritual sacrifices, in the Old, Old Testament, or we all say the Old Covenant, right? It's another way of saying that. The victim's blood was poured at the base of the altar. So they would take the blood of the animal and they would pour it. They would just, I mean, it was a bloody thing. They would pour blood at the base of the altar in the two corners of the altar. So it wasn't just like they sacrificed, but there was a, this big significance of spreading the blood around the altar as an oblation for the sins of the people, right? And um, so... <clears throat> The image here is, now, what we're seeing here is there, a Jewish person would understand, wait a minute, these are sacri- like the blood of the sacrificed animals will go by the altar. But for Christians, what we realize is that what the vision showed is this is the blood of the, of the Christians that died uh, for Jesus Christ. And we call them martyrs. And um, the lamb, and so here it's the image of the blood of the slaughtered martyrs, like the blood of the slaughtered lamb, is received by God as a sacrifice and will move him to intervene to bless and save his people. Now, the, the blood of the martyrs are going to scream out, like, we shed our blood for you, Jesus. We want you to, you know, take care of the people that killed us. I mean, in other words, there is, they're asking for vengeance. I mean, it, this, is a little, this is a difficult to read, but like, he basically is saying that the martyrs are crying out from heaven, saying, we sacrificed our life for you, and we patiently endured the suffering, but we know that you'll take care of those that killed us. 
<laughs> right? You mess with the wrong guy. I mean, I, I know, and obviously God is merciful, but they don't repent for this. There will be a judgment for those that killed Christians, for those that slaughtered the Christians. Now, let's kind of, let's kind of transition a little bit to our belief as Catholics. We know that in the altars, of, you know, upstairs in our altar, we have a relic. Of, and you have to, usually it's a confessor, uh, a virgin, and a martyr. Now you, I think you always have to have a martyr in there. I, um, I, I could check, I, could, I know the name, but I, I wrote, wrote it down. It's a first century martyr that we, that we had, and we just put them back into the altar from the old altar, right? And um, where do we come up with that tradition? Well, in the early church, after the Christians were martyred, whether, whether it be the Colosseum or the Circus Maximus, they would gather the bodies um, bury them, they carry them to the catacombs. That's where we bury the Christians because you couldn't bury uh, Christians anywhere else because they would just take the bodies and burn them, right? And so they had to hide the bodies of the, of the beloved. And remember, the Romans, what they used to do is they would try to get the bodies of the Christians and incinerate them and, and spread their ashes to mock our teaching of what? The resurrection of the body. And so the Christians tried to save their own, you know, they would uh, try to try to as much as they could to get the get the, um, the bodies of the martyrs, and then they would place them in little niches. Have any of you been, I know some of you have been to Rome, but have you, have you been to the catacombs before? Okay, so catacombs, and basically it's, it's fascinating. There's these tunnels, miles and miles of tunnels. And uh, they only bring it to a certain part because you can, you can seriously get trapped in there, and people have, you know, they never come out. And uh, so you go to certain parts, and, um, and then what they do is, what the Christians do is they bury the person, and they would celebrate the mass over the body of the, of the dead. So there's this image of, you know, the blood of the martyrs crying out to heaven even at the mass. Um, now, now notice, what are they doing? Um, we go back to the, uh, so when they broke up the soldiers who had been slaughtered because of the witness they bore for the word of God, so they, they preached the word, and because they were true to God's word and to his teachings, they were, they were killed. And they cried out in a loud voice, How long will it be holy and true master before you sit in judgment to avenge our blood on the inhabitants of the earth? Now, uh, this, this mimics something that happened in the book of Genesis, the first murder, right? In Genesis chapter 4, verse 10, you know, um, God says to, to Cain, he says what? He says, your blood cries out to me from the ground. Right, so God, after the first murder, He says, "Your blood cries out to me in the ground," and and um, and so basically, what this is, what this uh, passage is showing us is that in the mass, which is, you know, a foretaste of heaven, but also where it's a it's sort of uh, a foretaste of heaven, but what you experience on earth is the intercession of the saints that are intensely interested in our protection, right? And they're also asking for God to make things right, to bring His justice to the earth. And so the saints are, are, praying, are praying for us, and, and every Mass we're united to the martyrs in heaven and all the saints. St. Thomas Aquinas writes, This prayer of the martyrs is nothing other than their desire to obtain resurrection of the body and to share in the inheritance of those who will be saved in the recognition of God's justice and punishing evildoers. Right? So we, also, we believe that God is merciful, but he's also what? He's also just. And the saints are praying that God set it right. Get rid of evil. You know, we endured evil out of love for you. Now take care of it. And what does it say in the Bible? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Okay? So a lot of times, I mean, it's, it's very consoling that if we're getting beaten up for doing the right thing, is that, our, you know, the victory will, will be ours essentially. All right? There's this, it's, that's a promise of God for those who, who get kicked for being for Christ, that, there are, that their day is coming. Now, the Lord tells them, what is, what is response to these, these saints crying out? Uh, they want justice for the killers to get what they deserve. Um, and this was interesting in one of the commentary. And this is, it's, it's going to strike you as odd, all right? That part of the joy of, of heaven is to see the punishment of those in hell that deserved it. Now, this, that, I mean, imagine that in a homily on Sunday. <laughs> right, no, but you think about it, it's like not, not that it's not you're happy for the person, but that justice was made. Like that... Things like people didn't mock God. I mean, it's 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 just strange. It's like you ever think? I mean, that's like not not like Schadenfreude, but I, I read them like I had to read like three times that some theologians say the part of the joy of heaven is knowing that everyone got what they deserve. You got what you deserve, and they got what they deserve. 
I mean, that's, I mean, right now, I mean, in a sense, like we, mercy is, is getting what we don't deserve, but justice is getting what we deserve. And um, so, I mean, you have to, you have to think about that. I mean, I, I mean it's, it's, it doesn't sound very Catholic, and we're always, we always emphasize what, you know, everyone's going to go to heaven, blah, 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 you know. But if you read the book of, of Revelation, it's a little bit different. You know, we've got the martyrs or, or say, look, you know, and they knew, I mean, they prayed for those who killed them. They don't want them to, but those who do, they, it's not so much for what happened to them, for what they do to Christ, right? And how they mock Christ and Jesus Christ. Like, that's my king, right? There's a, there's a really powerful I- I- image there. Um, all right, so how does Jesus respond? He, well, he says, okay, great. He goes, he gives them a white robe. We've already talked about that numerous times. What's a right, white robe? Well, it's a symbol of our, our baptismal innocence, the thing we receive at baptism, but, um, but also in the Roman times that the, vic- the victor of a battle, uh, you know, rolled into a chariot wearing what? A white robe. It was a sign of victory. So you have your, your victory robe. And then he says, be patient. And what he means here is that there are many more martyrs that will die first, that have to die first for the, for the sake of the lamb. And then, uh, and then God will punish those who do not repent at the end. Interestingly enough, I think in the, in the last hundred years, more people, I, I, I don't know where I read this, and I don't know if it's true, but I'd have to double check it. But I read somewhere that more people have died from the faith in the last hundred years than all the rest of church history combined. Which is because you always think that what? It was the first century. That's when a majority of, of martyrs happened. I don't think that's true. You know, I mean, you take Auschwitz and you take some of these other things. I just finished a book, He Leadeth Me, about priests in Siberia. He was lucky. You know, he got out. A lot of those guys were smoked, you know. And um, I, they're, they're, you don't hear the stories of the martyrs anymore because we live in a very sanitized, you know, everybody, you know, it's freedom of religion, all this other stuff. But there are parts of the world where, People are seriously persecuted for their faith, right? And we heard a couple years ago in France, I mean, that priest got, you know, killed in his, his own cathedral. You know, these things happen. But I think it's much more than we see. Because the newspaper's not going to talk about that, right? Uh, talk about everything else, but not that, right? All right, so, so this, is, this is kind of a setup um, to the sixth seal. So the fifth seal is, is the, this, the image of, of God, you know, basically this uh, be, uh, avenging for the martyrs and interceding for them, and also the saints interceding for us. And then you have the sixth seal, and the, the title here, it says terror. And let's, let's, go to, let's go to the text. All right, so we have... Um, okay, one, hold on a second. Then I, okay, verse 12, right? Okay, here we go. Let's read it. Um, well, let's... Wait, wait, let's finish verse 11. Each of them was given a white robe... And they were told to be patient a little while longer until the number was filled. What does that mean? Those that haven't died yet that are supposed to die for me. We, there's much more, much more martyrs to happen. And their fellow servants and brothers are, who are going to be killed as they had been. So he basically, nope, there's more people that have to shed their blood for me first. And then I'm going to make it happen. Okay. Um, it's a mystery. Why does, why does God permit this, you know, for his glory? But that's what it is. Uh, verse 12, then I watched while he broke open the sixth seal and there was a great earthquake. The sun turned as black as dark sackcloth and the whole moon became like blood. The stars in the sky fell to the earth like unripe figs shaken loose from the tree and a strong wind. Then the sky was divided like a torn scroll curling up in every mountain island was moved from its place. The kings of the earth, the nobles, the military officers, the rich, the powerful, and every slave and free person hid themselves in caves and among mountain crags. They cried out to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, because the great day of their wrath has come and who can withstand it? All right. Now, first off, I want you to look at that text. And can you count how many parts of creation are there? Just take a moment and look at that text and what's being affected, affected here. And so he breaks the, we see the breaking open of the sixth seal. And we see, number one, the earth is affected, right? All right, because we have the great earthquake. Then we see the sun. The sun turns black. There's an eclipse. The moon the stars, the sky, 
mountains, islands, and humankind. All right, so what do, what do you think we're, we're, we're talking eight different things here. We're talking about all creation is being affected by this sixth seal, with this breaking up of the sixth seal. And every part of creation um, in totality will be judged by God. All right, and um, if we fast forward uh, right before Jesus will come to judge the living and dead, all of creation will, will be judged. And then there is, and we see here that first there's an earthquake. Um, now, what we're going to notice, we're going to see this again. What is earthquake, write this down, represents that God's powerful intervention is happening. When the earth shakes, it means God's about to do something powerful. All right. I think a great depiction of that is when you're watching The Passion of the Christ, when, uh, you know, the, after, when the, when the, when the, there's that scene where it looks like the, the tear of the Father coming down from heaven. And what happens when it hits the ground? The earth shambles, right? Is this whole thing that my son, the Lamb of God, has died. Like, it's been, the curse has been broken. And I just, and it's, you know, and the Roman soldiers are shaking. And, and literally, look at the Bible. That's what happened. That the earth shook, right? And what happened is the veil of the temple was torn in two. That's God intervening to, for humanity, Right? And um, at the coming of the Lord, the earth will tremble, right? Um, now, um, we can also see this in Amos chapter 8, verse 8. You can write that down and look it up later in your own personal time. And it says in Amos, and the prophet Amos says, Will not the land tremble for this and all who live in it mourn? Uh, okay, and then, there will, then we see this eclipse of the sun, Right? So there's some, some there, there will be this sort of, when the sixth seal is open, this eclipse will happen. And it says, the sun became as black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood. Okay, and um, so right here is, this is, this is basically a, a prophetic, uh, you know, basically a, uh, all creation is being, is being kind of restored, but he's, he's bringing it right. And I'll, I'll give you... Uh, some, some. The problem with this is now it goes into this whole like you know cross referencing with other scriptures. But um, let's uh, let's look at the eclipse of the sun. Turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 32, 32 verse seven. All right. So if you go to the Old Testament and go to Moses and in, in the desert, Exodus chapter thirty two verse seven. And let's see what we have here that makes more sense of what we're seeing in the book of Revelation. All right, so uh, we see uh, Exodus chapter 2, uh, verse 7. And it says, Then the Lord God said to Moses, Go down at once, because your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have acted corruptly. Okay? And uh, they have quickly turned aside from the way I've commanded, making themselves a molten calf. Um, and so, why did they lead us there? <laughs> Well, it's like that didn't answer. Well, I mean, I think too is like when when Moses came off the mountain, what did they hear? Yeah, I mean, they heard an earthquake, and so God was was shaking up all the evil that's happening off the mountain, right? And so it's restoring. It's restoring. The moon became like blood. There's a judgment of the stars, and stars. Interesting enough, the stars are images of government, and they are also the clocks that show that time is running out. So, it is, in other words, so basically the whole image of stars is idea of, you know, the sort of time, the time is running out. And then we have the wind and Zachariah's, um, you know, that we have this introduction of the, of, and then the fig tree. All right, so what's the fig tree? What's that all about? That's a symbol of what? God's, God's people, the Israelites, and, um, and then the, the sky vanishing like a scroll rolled up. Uh, is, the, is the word of God, Isaiah 34, verse 4. And then the last thing is every mountain island moved out of their places is uh, the non-Jewish people. All right, so the mountains and the islands represent the Gentiles, okay, if you're looking at scriptures. Now, where you can see that is I'll give you a couple of scriptures, and one is Isaiah 41, verse 5, okay? So once again, this is, these are all imageries that everyone, the, even the non-Jewish people, the non-Christians, everyone's going to be judged by God when the earthquake comes and the sun is darkened and, um, and the fig tree will be shaking. All right. And then in verse 15, it says this, then all the kings of the earth, 
the governors and the commanders, the rich people and the men of influence, the whole population, slaves and citizens, hid in caverns and among the rocks of the mountains. They said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us away from the one who sits on the throne from the retribution of the Lamb. For the great day of his retribution has come, who can face it? All right, now what are we seeing here is that this is basically, you look at that list of people, and we see every type of person is kind of mentioned there. Slaves, rich people, poor people, believers, non-believers, and they're all doing what? They're hiding from what? From God and this wrath. So whatever they're experiencing is really scaring the hell out of them, right, in many ways. And, and the basic message is this, is that... Um, they would rather die by being crushed by rocks than face what's coming after the judgment. You know, like, to, and I guess that's, it's an interesting vision is like seeing the holiness of God and his power, right? And you're like, wow, I've mocked you my whole life. And you see his beauty and wonder. It's like, that's got to be like, I don't want to look at you. Right? I mean, you think about this too, is the image of, if you've been in dark, all, you know, if you get up in the middle of the night and you flip the light on, it's like, you know, someone, you know, your kid walks in your room and throws, you know, puts the light on. He's like, hey, turn the lights off, right? Because you're just not using. Imagine if, like, you know, all of a sudden you see God all powerful, all holy right in front of you. You're going to hide and say, I'd rather have rocks fall on me than have to deal with this almighty God, this powerful God. All right, so um, it's interesting here is that, um, you know, I think one, one thing we have to look at is, let's look, let's look at the catechism for a second. You know, because we're looking at is, this is, all, this is all a prelude to what? The last what? Last judgment. When Jesus comes to judge the living dead. The, the, key, the key paragraph in the catechism, if you want to look at it and, and sort of know the Catholic view of the last judgment, it's, it's 1040. 1040. And uh, I'll, read it. I'll read it slowly. We can op- open up a little bit here. It says, The last judgment will come when Christ returns in glory. Only the Father knows the day and the hour. Only He determines the moment of His coming. And through, then, through His Son, Jesus Christ, He will pronounce the final word on all history. We shall know the ultimate meaning of the whole work of creation and the entire economy of salvation, understand the marvelous ways by which His providence let everything towards its final end. I've always liked that line, line, is that at the final judgment, you're going to see why God permitted everything and how it led to the final end. Everything. I mean, even, even your mistakes that God used for your good if you turn to his mercy, right? How he's victorious through the... Sh- Remember, because there's a lot of images of what? The shedding of the blood, right? For those that repented, it's going to be like, wow, this is so beautiful, like God permitted that evil, but God made such good out of it. But for those that re, that reject this 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 beautiful message of mercy, uh, it's it, there. It's you know. And so, but anyway, the last judgment will reveal God's justice, how God's justice triumphs over all the injustices committed by His creatures, and that God's love is stronger than death. Right. So, like that 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 um, cry of the martyrs saying, "How long will it be?" They're going to see, like, "Wow, now I know." why that happened to me and how, God, you made good out of it. And then those that have rejected God, like, oh my gosh, if I just listened to my mom, <laughs> you know, I mean, just like, you know, I mean, it would have been great. You know, it's just this whole thing. It's like, why, why was I so dumb, right? Why didn't I just listen to God, right? This is going to be this huge awakening. And you know, we talk about <laughs> the woke culture. This is going to be a definite woke culture <laughs> at the end, but it's going to be much more intense than what's going on today in society. Um, and I think the final thing, too, is that this whole message in this section of chapter 6 is it can be paraphrased in the Catechism in number 1041. You know, why do we read sections like this in the Bible? Well, it's, it, it says this, the message of last judgment calls men to conversion while God has still given them an acceptable time. Right? Like, you know, this, this stuff's happening, but, we, you know, just, just take advantage of what God's given you. The, the day of salvation. Okay, any questions on that? Chapter 6? All right, great. All right, chapter 7. Now, what happens here is you got to stop here. We kind of, in, in the Bible, we take a commercial break because how many seals are there? Seven. Seven. Now, you're going to notice, like, there's going to, before, like, pinnacle moments, like, God gives John a vision. And so now it's like, you know, you're thinking, like, okay, the six was pretty intense. What's the seventh vision going to be, right? The seventh, the seventh break of seal, which is going to be 
another seven trumpets. So it's like, oh, here we go. For, for, for me, that's like, oh, it's a lot of work, you know. I thought we could just have a quick vision and move on to the next thing. But the seventh seal, when that's opened up, we're going to have the seven blowing of the trumpets. And seven things will happen before God comes, right? So a lot of sevens, right? But he's going to have a, a vision of heaven. Now, turn to your, turn to your Bibles to uh, chapter 7 of Revelation and just out of curiosity, uh, let's just take a look at how, I like uh, how they um, title it, because sometimes it gives you a, a sense of uh, what we're talking about. What's the title there in bold? The 144,000 sealed. So what are we going to focus on? No, not seven, the 144,000. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, a lot of times it's, I mean, yeah, seven do, but like, I think a lot of times when you see this, you know, when you're looking at the bold, that's kind of like the main topic, right? So we're going to, he's going to see this vision of 144,000. All right. So let's stop here, take a breath and let's, let's look at, let's read, uh, let's read from uh, verse one uh, to verse seven, uh, verse eight. And we could do seven, you know, but let's do verse eight. Okay. All right. Here we go. After this, I saw, um, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. All right, stop. You know what that means already, right? The four angels is like the four parts of the earth. We already talked about the four creatures, right? What type of angels were they? Come on, come on. You're killing me. What are, what are they? Second type of angels. Cherubim, cherubim. cherubim, thank you. Okay, I almost had a heart attack, right? Seraphim, cherubim, right? We're going to talk about archangels in a bit. But remember, top or seraphim, what's the second type? Cherubim, cherubim. good. So he, has this, he sees four angels, most likely. What? Cherubim, we've already discussed this. All right, standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth. No, that's key. They're holding back the four winds of the earth. Okay, what's that all about? Uh, so that no wind can blow on the land or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel come up from the east, holding the seal of the living God. All right, that's going to be key, the seal. What's the seal of the living God? All right, because you need the seal. And... What does it say here? He cried out in a loud voice to the four angels who were given power to damage the land and the sea. Do not damage the land or the sea or the trees until we put the seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Let's stop there. All right, because we haven't got to 144,000. We got to talk about, wait a minute, what's he saying here? And we need this seal on our forehead before all hell breaks loose. Okay? And don't worry. I think everyone in this room has been sealed. I want you to think about that. Everyone in this room, I would suspect, has got the seal. Okay. So. Uh, okay. So in this, there's a... So there, this is... These are... This vision is depicts what's going to happen to God's people before and after the big trial. Okay, whatever the big trial is, right? The big tribulation is what it's called. There will be the great trial. It's one of the, it's, it's been, it's, it's in the catechism that there will be the trial of all trials that will affect everyone. If we're alive at the moment, it will affect all of humanity, Christians included. We don't get, we're not raptured out of it. Like people, you know, like there's that, the whole Protestant thing where so the elect are like sucked out of the earth and then they're put back on the earth. No, nope, we'll be in there. But if we're sealed, we're going to be protected and we'll persevere. Doesn't mean we won't suffer, but we'll come out what? Okay at the other end. Is everyone happy about that? <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like, because yeah, we're like, wait a minute. I mean, we don't want to suffer. But once again, he kind of, he's kind of saying no, but we're being given some help. Now, uh, let's, let's look at this. So now we need to decode this imagery. All right. Now, we, the four corners of, is, represents, write this down again if you don't remember, the whole world. Anytime you see four corners, it represents the whole world. So Jesus is going to come, and he had four angels at each spot. You know, it's, all, it's all covered, the four corners of the world. And the wind... Remember the wind? The wind represents the coming of Jesus either with cursings or blessings. Not just with blessings, but also what? Curses. So that's also, that's also what? Symbolic of his mercy and judgment. 
right? So the winds, once they, once he lets the wind, once the windstorm comes, it's going to be a curse for those that are not sealed, and for those that are that are sealed, it will be a sort of mysterious blessing. Are you with me? Okay. Uh, you will not need fans in your bedrooms when the wind comes. Okay. The trees. Now this is interesting. The trees, because we'll see this again later, are representative of human beings. Okay, biblically, when you see trees mentioned in Scripture, Old Testament, many times they're representative of human beings. Okay, so we're decoding the imagery here that comes from from the Old Testament and from... uh, Okay, now, now, there's another angel and his job. Oh, there's got the four angels holding back the wind. And then there's another angel that, that pops in. And what's his job? To deliver a message uh, and protect those that are sealed by God. Okay? Now, once again, we see in this, these lines of Scripture, before harm is inflicted and judgment comes, God's servants must be marked with a seal. Okay? He says, do not damage the land or the sea or the trees. What are the trees? Humans. The humans. Right? until we have put the seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Okay? Now, have you ever seen the movie Gladiator? Right? Good movie? Good. All right. Uh, it's great. So there's this uh, Maximus, he's he, on his shoulder, he's got this, the emblem of, of Caesar. And, and most soldiers, when they, you know, uh, when you became a soldier, they would take a brand and they would, you know, it's kind of like your whole, and they would just burn a scar. Like they do that in some fraternities, unfortunately, too. They do, they do this still today. They'll brand you in certain uh, types of, yeah, and they and the brand. But you're marked. And you also do that to what? To cattle, to horses. You brand them. And what does that mean? Uh, so it's a seal of ownership that whoever you're sealed by owns you. All right? It's a, it's a mark of ownership. Uh, but it also indicates the owner's right to protect, to protect that that particular whatever it is, okay. So Caesar, you belong to Caesar. That's his property. If you mess with Maximus, you're in trouble because he's Caesar's property, right? And if it's if if I if I brand my horse and you break my horse's leg, you know, there's there's problems with that because I I have to protect. I also have the the duty to protect that horse because it's mine. It's branded, right? And us, who have been sealed by Christ, are protected in some way from this tribulation that's coming. Are you with me? Okay, now, um, let's, look at, let's, look, let's look at this. Uh, there's an interesting, uh, the prophet Ezekiel, and I, uh, darn it, why didn't I write this down? Which one it is? Maybe you can look it up, Google it. But in the, in the book of Ezekiel, uh, God tells... The is told it tells the prophet Ezekiel to he there, God tells another angel in that in that vision to mark uh, his own with a tau cross. All right, a tau cross. Is everyone with me? So he right prophet Ezekiel. Do you know which which where that is? Ezekiel fourteen twenty one. Is that in the cross references? Very good. All right, everyone, open your Bibles to Ezekiel fourteen verse twenty one. Thank you, Michael. Ezekiel 14, 21. All right, now this is important. I want you to kind of, I want you to figure this out. Let's, let's try to decode this a little bit because a lot of times in order to decode the New Testament, you got to look at the unity of Scripture and what does it say in the Old Testament? And did anybody get there before me? Ezekiel, here we go. What is it again? 14? 21. Let's, let's take a look at this real quick. All right, I am there and... Verse 21, thus says the Lord God, even though I send against Jerusalem my four evil punishments. Notice, what do we see in the book of Revelation? The four winds, right, which is cursing and blessings. In this vision in Ezekiel, he's got four punishments, the sword, famine, wild beasts, and plague, to cut off from it human being and beasts alike. There will be some survivals in it who will bring out sons and daughters When they come out to you, you see their ways and their deeds. You shall be consoled. Uh, Where's the Tau cross? All right, anyway. I think it's 9 4. Wait, Ezekiel 9 4? 
Oh, that's it. Okay. All right, Michael Noor, that was a good one too because we got four plagues. Joey, what was that? 9-4. Nine. Nine, Everyone turn to 9-4 if you're watching this video. I was wrong. Ezekiel 9-4. Okay. You're like, this one's terrible. Okay. Uh, yes, here we go. Oh, you see there with the, the, the X here, right? So, 9-4. Uh, and it says, And he called to the man dressed in linen with the scribe's case at his waist. And the Lord said to him, Pass through the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and mark an X. The X is a towel cross on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over the abomination practiced within it. All right, now, tau cross. Some biblical scholars believe that Jesus was actually crucified on a tau cross. Okay, it was like a, a T, but it also represents an X. So, but but let's, let's stop for a moment. When were we anointed with a tau cross? Confirmation. Right? What's, what does the bishop do? He takes chrism oil and he marks what? The cross on your forehead. All right, now, this, this, this did not come from my commentaries. This came from Father Larry Swing, okay? So you can quote me later, but, like, you know, maybe I'll be a father of the church. I doubt it. But, like, I thought this. I mean, wait a minute. Now, they, they do mention, they do mention, they do mention the sacraments with, like, baptism, because in three of the sacraments, you get an indelible mark. Now, that also could be the, the mark of the soul, right? And when do you get an indelible mark? Baptism, confirmation, and what's the third? You... None of you got it, but I got it. Holy orders. Three indelible marks. How many here are confirmed? Okay, very good. I was going to sign up for RCA. Becky, I know you're confirmed. Raise that hand. Okay, good. All right. So, you have, so we have the, the towel cross, all right? So now, why is, why is this important? Um, well, because in each of these sacraments, we receive this mark, the towel cross on our forehead. Well, or mar- our souls are marked. And also... Uh, Many, many times, this is also an image. The Tau cross was marked, the soldiers were also marked with an image. So this, there's an image of those that have to fight, but they're also protected by their owner, which is God. Okay? And, um, and since it's on the form of the cross, I would have to say that this is, points to the chrism oil by the bishop who signs the cross on our foreheads. And what is the purpose of Confirmation. It gives us the grace to, to, be, to have fortitude and to defend our faith with word and deed, especially when we encounter what? Difficulties, right? Uh, I, I can't remember where, where I read this, but I, there was, I can't remember, I think it was St. Vincent Ferrer. If you ever want to like, not sleep, read St. <laughs> Vincent Ferrer's homilies, okay? He's just like him, and uh, there's a couple others. Like St., uh, another one is like that is, oh, St. Alphonse Liguori. Like anytime I get Liguori, I read St. Alphonse Liguori, and I'm like, I'm just like, oh my gosh, like my prayer life's on target for like three days. And he's just, because he's so, those two are just on fire. And St. Vincent Ferrer made a comment, and I read it somewhere. He said that he was commenting on the book of Revelation and said only, we haven't got there yet, but only those that are confirmed will be able to survive the deception of the Antichrist. And that's cool, isn't it? Right? So we won't even acknowledge it. Yeah, so in other words, one of the graces of, of confirmation will be uh, that uh, when the Antichrist comes, that you, you will not be seduced by his machinations. But those that don't have the grace of confirmation will fall prey to it. You better get that vaccination with that towel cross, right? <laughs> right you, know, you, won't get, I mean, you, won't be, you won't be seduced by, by, by the Antichrist. So we, we, we'll get to the Antichrist later. But I just thought this is like he's preparing them. And one of the preceding things before Christ comes is you have to deal with the tribulation. And prior to the tribulation, who's involved with that is the Antichrist. All right. And I thought about this. I was, my head was spinning because I was thinking, wait a minute. Like this year, even a pandemic, all these people like called me. And I got two more coming that want to get confirmed. Because they watched a YouTube video? Or do you think the Holy Spirit's marking them? You know? And here's the other thing. How many teenagers at Riken High School are not confirmed? A ton of them. Really? Right? Uh, do you want to get confirmed, Harry? No, not really. Okay, fine. You, you can choose later. Well, guess what? Because mom and dad don't go to church. They were confirmed, but they're not living their faith. But there are so many teenagers. I bet you if I, I, that's when, I'm, when I get to Riken, I'm going to ask, how many are confirmed? Just sign up for confirmations, you know? 
have a confirmation class. You know, so I mean, just as you think about it, like this is, is, what is, what does he do? This angel is sent out to make sure that everyone is marked with the tau cross, right? Okay, now, all right, now we got to go to 144,000. What does this mean? All right, so once again, are we talking about that only 144,000 people are in heaven? Of course not, right? All right, so numbers, we, we don't take them literally when we read the Bible, but we have to look at, we have to look at um, what, what the symbolic representation is. All right, now, write this down, 12, important. 12 represent, stands for the whole of God's people, right? And we see 12, like the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles. There's always this reference. When you're talking to a group of people, there's always a reference to 12, all right? Now, 144,000 stands for completeness and perfection, okay? So 144,000 in itself stands for completeness and perfection, uh, now, we see 12 times 12, which is a perfect square, according to my commentary. And it's also considered more inclusive and complete if you multiply it by 1,000. So there's mathematical stuff going. So 12 times 12, two complete numbers. Perfect square times 1,000 means like this complete number. So what it means is the whole of the people of God. So he saw all the saints, all the church triumphant in heaven, those after the persecution survived. So this is a vision of later, all right? Those that have made it to heaven. And, um, and so this, actually this is good news because the, this is a great number. And it means this, that the hope is there will be a great number of people that will be saved. Okay, now, which gives us hope, <laughs> you know. Now, also our Lord says... You know, they ask, they ask, well, many say it's few, and many, many will not be, but the good news is many, there was a great number, 144,000, so it's an enormous sort of number. Now, another thing that's interesting is that um, 1,000 is also the largest military unit in a Roman army. So we also see sort of in this number a significance of God's army or troops, right? So you have you know, 140 different uh, thousands of armies that are, you know, that are there, okay? And um, so you can only have up to 1,000 men under a single commander. And so this imagery brings forth an interesting truth that uh, as a holy army, the church is called to bear witness, is warfare, okay? So the other thing we're seeing in this 144,000 is that St. John is making, there's a military sort of image here that life on earth is warfare and God himself will fight for his people like he did for the Israelites in the desert uh, in Egypt and also when he defeated the Syrians in the time of Hezekiah. So this is idea that they made it to heaven because they were protected, they were in God's army and God fought for them through the warfare they experienced on earth. Is that cool or not? Right, well, sort of, okay. Um, but I think, too, is protection from what? Is it implying that we'll be physically protected? No. The implication here is that this is more of a spiritual protection rather than what? A physical protection, right? Because a lot of times, I mean, I, I think, you know, uh, life is just, it can be brutal warfare, and, and we're, we're not necessarily protected from pain and trials. That's just part of life. It's part of the spiritual battle. But we're spiritually protected. Our souls are spiritually protected with this mark that the angel gave us, which we received at what? Confirmation. Okay? Uh, all right. So let's, let's move on. Uh, then he sees another vision. So you understand 144,000? Completeness. Military imagery, life is warfare. We're protected spiritually, not necessarily physically, because most of these people got hacked up. <laughs> <You know? laughs> they were martyrs, all right. But but they but it, it ended well, right? All ends well. Okay? Not everyone was died a martyr, but a vast majority of this vision did. Okay. After this I looked and behold a great multitude which no man could number. Right? Once again, we get this huge number. No man can number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, 
clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their knees before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power might be to God our Father, forever, God forever and ever. Amen. Well, what's going on here? Okay. Um, well, the great multitude, once again, are the saints in heaven. Now, we had this image of the 144,000. What do we call? These are those that survived the tribulation on earth. What do we call the church? The church what? Militant. What do we call them in heaven? The church triumphant, right? So this is image of what we see. Imagery is a palm, you know, what is it? Uh, palm branches, right? And um, I'm having a, uh, just a senior moment. We use Palm Branch. It's, that's what we use at Ash Wind. I mean, uh, uh, Palm Sunday, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, of course. Sorry. Where do I see that image? Yeah, Palm Sunday, idiot. Palm Sunday, right? And like, now remember, what is that? What is that an image of? Did Jesus goes on a donkey triumphant, right? It's an image of the King coming into the Jerusalem, right? And that's also, in, in some ways, when we go to heaven, we'll be carrying what? Palm branches, saying Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, right? It's a triumphant thing. It's like really happy. And then like 15 minutes later, it's really sad during Palm Sunday, right? Because then we go into the Passion. You know, we have to first go to the Passion before we get our palms, right? But we do it the opposite. We get the palms and then we do the Passion. All right, so these are the saints in heaven. There's a church who survived the tribulation. And then it says, notice that no man can number in the Old Testament. God told Abraham that he would be a father of many nations, and his progeny be too many to count. And he'll say in Genesis 15, 50, once again, this is sort of, in imagery, a lot of times it's going to go back and forth. And when God said, you'll be a father of many nations, and he says, look at the stars in the sky. But then in, Gen in Genesis uh, 32, 12, he said that those, that his people would be as many as the sands in the seashore. You know, like this, if you go to the seashore and you look at the sand, that's quite a bit. All right, now, now, the nice thing about this is the martyrs and these saints, they don't appear gloomy or weary, right? They're not sad. They're very happy, right? They're, they're, experiencing, uh, they're experiencing great joy, the joy of heaven. And we call heaven, right? It's not just a better place. We call it the fulfillment of all joy, right? And, uh, and once again, there, what do we have again? The, the white robes, we've already been through this like a gazillion times already. As a sign of victory, the Roman general, if he won a war, celebrated his triumph wearing white. And, um, and it's actually interesting. The palms, you know where we see this also in the Bible? In Maccabees, right? In Maccabees. After they defeat um, Antiochus Epiphanes, right? He was that, that really evil guy that, that d destroyed their temple and killed all the, you know, killed everybody and wouldn't let them worship. And, and then, remember, Judas Maccabeus gets, you know, kind of gets his... He was like William Wallace, and he got a bunch of you know, ragtag um, you know, followers, and they just, with a small army, defeated these very powerful Greek armies, right? And after they defeated the armies, they went into the temple carrying what? Palms. Like, now we can go back to church, right? You know, and um, yeah, so this is, uh, these people entered the city with branches, and, and, uh, and, and they, brought, they had palms in their hands. It says in Maccabees chapter 10, verse 7, carrying rods and trine with leaves, beautiful branches and palms. They sang hymns of grateful praise to him who had successfully brought about the purification of his own place. And they were, they were praising God for getting all the, you know, the wickedness out of their, out of their temple. Remember, uh, so they go, and there's a beautiful scene in Maccabees when, when they finally defeat the enemy and they go into the church and it's in rubbles and they all weep because they realize, like, our precious building has been completely destroyed. It'd be like, you know, if someone ransacked the, the, you know, upstairs, you know, that uh, sanctuary, which spent so much time on, and just destroyed it. I mean, I'm sure people would be weeping, you know, that if someone came and vandalized it, right? And so, it, but they, they, and then they got it restored, and then the joy of being able to go back in the temple and to worship, uh, they're wearing. So this is what the, these, these are what the, these are what the, uh, these martyrs are experiencing. Um, you know, once again, going back to this imagery of like this great number of people who gave their lives for Christ, um, just a you know fun fact for you: 
Does any, take a guess how many Christians were martyred uh, from year from you know from the time of Christ's death to three twenty five. Throw out a number. It's just for twenty dollars monopoly money. What do you think? What is it? No, a lot more than that. A lot more than that. Seven million. Yeah, seven million people were martyred from thirty three A.D. to three twenty five according to scholars. It's a lot of blood, isn't it? Yeah, 7 million people. Yeah, so now, if you put that in perspective, if, if, if what I said is true, do the math. A lot of, a lot of blood's been shed for the land. Right? Uh, now, notice those who gave their lives for Jesus from every nation, every nation, race, people, and tongue, what do we see there very clear that the church is what? Catholic. Why did I say Catholic? Every nation, right? Universal. The word Catholic means universal. We see that from every nation, right? And we're going back to Pentecost, remember? Uh, if we go, remember in that, that, that when, uh, when Peter baptized and that Pentecost, the 3,000 people, there's this list of names, uh, Medes, uh, Asia, whatever, and <laughs> something or other. All right, and and it was it's, it's and I always wondered like I remember like you know several years as a priest because I wasn't doing my homework. I was like, what is this? Why do I have to read all these names? And then when I finally did the homework, I'm like, oh my gosh, it was every nation was present, and one person from every part of the world got baptized and went home and brought Catholicism home. So from day one at Pentecost and the birthday of the church, every part of the world was Catholic. Pretty neat, right? And so they see in heaven that there was people from every na- every nation, race, people, and tongue. All right, and then so what are they crying out? They say, "Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb." And all the angels stood around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne, and around the elders and four living creatures, and they fell on their face before the throne and worshipped God, saying, "Amen." Blessed and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving, honor and power and might. Be to God forever and ever. Amen. What are they doing? They're giving worship to God who saved them. And, uh, and then it says, um, then one of, the, one of the enders asked me, these, these in white robes, who are they and where do they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are those who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Okay, so he's like, who are these guys? And these are the martyrs that wash their robes with the blood of the lamb. Okay. Uh, so there, what we see here is this in Revelation chapter 7, verse 14, is this reference, this first reference to the great tribulation. All right, now. Um, where do we see this in the Old Testament? All right. Um, well, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 is, is a, another reference. This is, this is kind of a reference to the, the vision that uh, the prophet Daniel had. Now, when we're reading this great tribulation, remember, remember going back to that first class, when we're reading the Bible and reading Revelation, where there's three ways of looking at it. Can someone turn their notes to class number one? So, uh, what were the three ways? You got the, histor- the historical, you got the what? The preterist view. Futurist. What are the three types? Futurist. Futurist. Preterist. 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 Historical. Historical. Okay. Now, when you're reading this, you got to look at all three. All right. So, did this happen? Yes. Is it happening? Yes. Will it happen? Yes. Okay. Now, this tribulation, has it happened? What's the answer? Uh, will it happen? Yes. Did it happen? Yeah. So, it's all three. All right. So, um, so this is about, this tribulation is about people will rise and persecute the faithful because they're loyal to the covenant. So these are, the tribulation is, is going to be an all-on attack against faithful Catholics, essentially. Okay, so part of the tribulation is those who have a strong faith will be persecuted, all right? And if you're faithful, you're going to be a part of it, whether you like it or not, eventually, if, if, it, if it is the time. Um, and so... But and also, it could the, the period. Did you know? You know what the period of the tribulation will be? How long it will be? Biblically, three and a half years. 
So the tribulation will last three and a half years. Okay, whatever it is, all right, whether it did. Now, it's interesting, in Maccabees, guess how long the persecution lasted? Three and a half years. So in the Old Testament, when they got torn up and they're fighting, all the, it, it basically, um, the chaotic period in the book of Maccabees was 164 to 168. You do the math, it's basically three and a half years. So it did happen, all right? Um, but also, this is a foreshadowing of the great tribulation that will happen prior to the second coming of Christ. So there'd be some kind of three and a half uh, tribulation. All right, so let's go to the catechism. What does the catechism say about the tribulation? Oh, man, I wish I brought my other book. I just... Um, Ralph, all right, so Ralph Martin just came out with a book called... The Church, it's the Church in Crisis? The name of the book? And he references this in his book. And he basically believes that we're there. Now, Ralph Martin is a little bit of a... He's a little bit of a... Uh, I mean, I, I, love, I love his talks. He's unbelievable. And he talked to a bunch of priests, and it was like, it was so funny. It was like totally divided. You either loved him or hated him. I loved him. And some of you guys hate him. But, um, but it, just, it just, what he said made complete sense. But he basically said some of the things you're seeing in the church and a lot of apostasy and um, rejection of the faith internally is a sign of, that the Antichrist is coming. Like, he just kind of feels like it's there. But in 675, uh, I wish I had the actual, maybe it's good I don't have this um, right now, because I'll look at it later, but I'll, I'll remind me. But he, in 675, he says, Before Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial, which will shake the faith of many believers. All right, many believers. Now, once again, let's go back. It won't shake those that are marked with the cross, right, in the state of grace. The persecution that accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the quote unquote mystery of iniquity. All right, so there will be, which is, which that's a nice word for the Antichrist will appear in the form of a religious deception, right? It will be in the form of religious deception. So it will be an internal leader that will deceive the faithful with false teachings, right? Uh, uh, offering men an apparent solution to their problems. At the price of apostasy from the truth. So this Antichrist will be internal, will lead people away from the truth uh, as a solution to the problems. The supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist, a pseudo-messianism by which man glorifies himself in the place of God and of his Messiah come in the flesh. All right, so there's a lot there. And we'll get, we'll get more into that when we go into the Mark of the Beast, which is 666. The Antichrist, and that brings up a lot of questions. What will that be? The Catechism actually spells it out. It explains who the Antichrist is. All right, has there been an Antichrist? Yes. Is there an Antichrist now? Yes. Will there be the ultimate Antichrist? Yes. I'm not sure if we have the ultimate yet. All right. Is he coming? Yes. All right. Now, he says something odd. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Like, obviously, you know, you don't wash white with blood, but uh, what we're talking about is a spiritual cleansing, all right? And uh, those who have, these are those who have heard and accepted the gospel, believe in Jesus Christ, have repented of their sins and have been baptized, and they've been uh, made clean by the blood shed on the cross. And quite frankly, at every Mass, we're purified by the blood of the Lamb. You know, one of the, one of the effects of, of daily, you know, if you go to daily Mass, right, and you're free from mortal sin, and you go in a lot of little peccadillo sins or venial sins or imperfections, when you go to Holy Communion, that's completely washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. Like you water a mass completely pure, purified by the blood of the Lamb. We also see that in the other sacraments too, uh, more, most, most especially in confession and, uh, and also anointing of the sick. And, and so notice that they stand before God's throne and worship him day and night. And this is where we're going we're gonna to kind of end here. All right, now. They're standing before the throne and worship him day and night. And this adoration is perpetual. They're perpetually adoring the Lamb, right? Uh, just a, a, a little uh, commercial. We have all night adoration this Friday if you want to partake in Revelation, right? And remember we talked about the Tamid sacrifice, right? The, the Jewish sacrifice. Only who could do the sacrifice? One of the priests, right? That was That was... 
it was able to do the sacrifice, but the sacrifice only happened twice a day. They were only the ones allowed to do the sacrifice. And, um, and you know, at specific times, we see here that all of these people are able to participate because they have been made priest by their baptism, right? So the, and it's perpetual. And, and notice in heaven that nothing evil will touch them and us after we have been persevering in the trials that stand before us in this earth. Um, let's, let's see, what time is it? Yeah, let's stop there. So next time we're going to go to verse 15 of chapter 7, right? And we'll, we'll go through 8 and 9. And that's good, because I want to go back and uh, hit those, those seven, the seven trumpets again. I mean, first round was really rough. So homework assignment is this. I want you to figure out what the heck are the seven trumpets? Like, what does that mean? Like, what are the, the seven trumpets? Now, I'll give you a little uh, insight. The seven, the ones blowing the seven trumpets are seven what? Types of angles. Take a guess. Cherubim? Wrong. What is it? Cherubim. Nope. Archangels. So there's, I want you to figure out who are the seven known archangels. We know three from sacred scriptures, another or, or more from uh, other sources. Uh, so they're basically seven known archangels. Figure out their names. And then I want you to figure out, using whatever sources you can, what are the seven trumpets and these, these, these sort of, uh, the winds now, once that, seventh, that seal is broken, the winds are let go, right? Figure out the curses and the blessings that happen when the trumpets are blown, okay? And the best one will get to skip class, get a free day off from the next <laughs> class, okay? Great. You know. All right, let's say a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.